This podcast is brought to you by KPN, the Kibble Podcast Network, bringing you lively and informative discussion about the successes and setbacks experienced by third sector organisations. To get involved, please visit podcasts.kibble.org for more information. You're listening to Social Enterprise Conversations, a podcast about social enterprises, the people behind them, the challenges they face, and the achievements that keep them moving forward. Each week, we will bring you a lively and informative discussion of a different social enterprise, getting to the heart of their story so we can share their knowledge and strengthen our sector. Hello, welcome to Social Enterprise Conversations, episode 51, with me, your host, Mark Fraser. On this episode, I have an interview with Amitra Graham from Glasgow-based social enterprise, Bridges Out of Poverty. Bridges Out of Poverty, Bridges Out of Poverty are a Scottish charitable training organisation that provides workshops, programmes and consulting services to help improve lives and build sustainable success in communities. They do this by creating an understanding of the dynamics that cause and maintain poverty from the individual to the community level. Amitra came down to the experience. We had a really nice chat. I don't really want to say too much more about what Bridges Out of Poverty do because Amitra gives a very good explanation of all the things that they do and the approaches that they employ in order to educate people about poverty and its causes. Here with uh, Amitra from Bridges Out of Poverty. How are you doing today? Doing well, thanks, Mark. How are you? Uh, you not not many people ask me that. I never <laughs> ask how I'm doing. Oh. <laughs> they usually just say, "Yeah, I'm fine. I'm I'm also fine. Thank you. A little bit Good. tired, but I'm okay." Good. Hope you get some rest when you need it. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the plan. So we're here to talk about you, not not to talk about me. Talk about you. Oh, okay. Uh, and the awesome things that Bridges Out of Poverty do. Um, so. It's, I like to think of it a little bit like a superhero origin story. So, what is your superhero origin story? Where does it begin My for you? My superhero origin story. Where does origin it, story. Where does it begin for you? Wow. Um, where does social enterprise begin for you? Gosh, um, I, I don't know if I see myself as a superhero. I see myself as um, someone interested in uh, bringing more transformative ways of working within communities. Um, I think the superheroes are developed um, within our community when we when we start using our empowerment and collaboration tool. Um, I think the people that design the empowerment and collaboration tool are superheroes. I feel like I'm just a, um, I am not just, a, I am a conduit to having the um, superheroes' voices and experiences seen and heard in our communities. Um, so that's that's what goes on for me when I hear the word superhero. Um, in terms of where does what was the other question? Something about co- the origin. Where, where did the your origins. where does your social enterprise journey begin? Okay, the origins of social enterprise for me began um, with it, it kind of started for me with uh, a journey around uh, wanting to make the world a better place, and um, I hadn't really engaged with social enterprises at all. On that journey, it started off with um, working with within other sectors, and um, in those sectors, I felt quite stifled, and I felt that um, I, although I, there was a there's a willingness in me to want to uh, look at words like empowerment, there was a lot of tokenistic work going on, and. Um, I remember being in in one environment where I was working within um, a sector looking at helping uh, have uh, local people's voices heard. And um, there was this word being banded about, about local people being hard to reach. And I was really curious about this because I didn't, the people that I spoke to didn't walk around going, look at me, I'm really hard to reach, you can't get me. And yet 
for me, what was going on was that the organizations I was working within, the tools that we were using weren't reaching them. And that the way that we were responding to that is we were calling them hard to reach. So I started becoming really curious about how can we make tools in our community that enable us to reach people rather than label them as hard to reach. And through that journey, you know, I went on to um, study transformative um leadership and community development and health and social care and did a lot of theoretical work and eventually came to the understanding that uh, in order for the the theory of um, empowerment and collaboration to be practiced in in reality um, using a a particular social theorist work called Paolo Freire um, there was going to be a need to start up my own organization Um, and um, and, and that's when Bridges Out of Poverty was founded. And that's when this word social enterprise came into my vocabulary. Previous to that, it was really about empowerment and collaboration and Paolo Freirean principles. Um, and, then, and then I went on to, to study social enterprise. Uh, I went to Edinburgh and there was a, a course um, by the Melting Pot. Um, it was a social innovation incubation award that I I received where I got to go to Edinburgh um, regularly for a year and understand what social enterprise was and I was just saying to Kerry on the journey here actually that um, there was a lot of theory about social impact social outcomes social enterprise at that point and and I learned all that material and I was really at the stage of just finding the organization and and getting my head around all that and 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 now you know Two years down the line, um, I'm, I'm really wanting to kind of join the dots of what that theory was about and what we're actually practicing as an organization um, and really connecting because I'm so busy doing within a social enterprise. I don't have as much time as I'd like to reflect on, you know, um, my journey within the within the social enterprise arena. So I'm really appreciating um, this invitation to to get me to stop and actually think about what I do, I think reflection is a really important part of practice. I think, uh, I mean, a lot of people have the same experiences. They kind of get this not this idea they want to do something, they want to help people, um, they want to create a business that helps people. Um, but not necessarily, they, they don't really become aware of like what that, if that's called anything or mm-hmm. what it is, just, and then they do it and then suddenly it's like, oh, by the way, you're a social enterprise and you're yeah. kind of like, well, wait, yeah, what is that? And then yeah. obviously you do what you do and you go and, you go and find out a bit more about it. Yeah. And, and that element about wanting to help people. And I've been so busy looking at what are we doing and are we actually helping people? Are we creating services that are uh, creating cultures of dependency? Uh, are we doing for rather than with? So, you know, with, with the greatest intentions as organizations we can go in with the idea that we're helping but sometimes um our services get developed for um a you know a purpose of helping and then we kind of lose the way a little bit so a big part of my practice is about concentrating on that that the bigger picture of social enterprise landscape um is one that you know I, i think i'd like to have more time to uh sit and reflect on um having having been invited here so uh, appreciating Kibble's inquiry around it. It's good to, it's, it's good to I guess it's sometimes good to take stock, but mm. um, the, the good thing about being a social enterprise is you can be very malleable in the sense that you can keep doing the work and it keeps having an, an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So with Bridges Out of Poverty, I suppose it's all about kind of measuring that impact on a day-to-day basis yes. and seeing like like how you're helping people and why you're helping people and you know what the outcomes are. Yes, is that, is that sound absolutely. Right? Yeah. And totally continuing to check out with local people was that helpful what we did there was that empowering or were we getting you to tell your poverty story and leaving you um feeling exposed and then going away and saying okay thanks very much we're a middle class organization we're going to go and fix that now um are we bringing you with us on our journey to look at solutions around poverty and um i i, I really find that that teacher learner exchange that paolo ferro talks about very much is, is going back and, and checking out with local people. Are we being helpful? Um, and I'm really interested in that conversation. And um, back to that slight mourning around not having enough uh, spaciousness to reflect. I think that that's part of my challenge um, being in a social enterprise in comparison to having worked in other pub, you know sectors is that the, the spaciousness that I require to lead this organisation 
um, alongside some amazing leaders who have supported us along the way and are supporting us along the way, the, the, the spaciousness that's required isn't there. And I would I really long for mm. more opportunities to um, have meaningful support um, in, a, in a way that I, I feel like as a, as a chief exec of this organization, I'm holding so much. And um, I would love to be able to let go of different elements of the business and relax in knowing that they are um, being led in a way that's uh, empowering and collaborative. Uh, I don't think that we're there yet. And and it's been my experience of, of other social enterprises that I've connected with that, um, you know, there, there isn't the spaciousness and the capacity um, that, that other sectors have um, to 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 deliver and continue to f- reflect and um, and also have that work life balance, which I think is really important as well. Why do you think that space isn't there to do that? Um, I think it's it it comes down to capacity and resources. So um, in order to go that extra mile, which Bridges Out of Poverty is very passionate about, um, that you know that it, it, it's 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 there's a high um, requirement for for resources and and our model talks about our empowerment and collaboration model talks about especially when we're working with local people that have low resources that initially there's a real need to invest a good amount of time and energy and um, and 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 therefore those that that time and energy needs to come from somewhere and it's and it's usually employees with a great deal of passion that um that that are are, are those that invest that time and energy so i guess it's, it's with any kind of startup is that it's very resource heavy and and the hope is that in time you know as as the movement grows and and, and strengthens there'll be more and more um support out there um and um the 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 spaciousness that I talk about so that we can we can all relax a little bit in our roles because there's more and more people taking leadership um, but initially um, I think the other thing that goes on as well is that because we're new and we're quite innovative there's a curiosity about what we're about so we're oftentimes stretched um, and, and and pulled into dof- different arenas and it's about for us being in choice because um, alongside those different arenas there's not always uh, an investment in terms of um, money, you know, in, in terms of our time. So we're doing a lot of stuff for free and for fun. Um, and and that, that takes away the spaciousness that we need for that work-life balance. Well, the work-life balance is something I don't think I've really touched upon too much in this podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's something I've always wondered about, but mm-hmm. usually when you're talking to someone, the conversation kind of develops itself. Um, but work-life balance is a really good, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to talk about, especially if you are in charge of a company. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Is that a struggle? Um, it, it's something that I, I would say is a challenge and it needs, there's a conscious effort that I need to make. And I think it's about being an example of a transformative leader in that um, I'm really wanting to dispel the the theory that's bounded about that actually as a transformative leader for a social enterprise, you can't have work-life balance. You need to um, burn the candle at both ends. And I'm really protective over burnout. So um, I want to lead an organisation where people um, have lunch breaks and you know stop at a reasonable hour and and check out what hours they work best, whether it's morning and evening, and respond to those. So that kind of flexible working hours element um, is one that you know I really want to disband the the the, the theory that it's not possible to have that. Um, and 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 you know I guess it, it, it you know for me. Um, the way that I practice that is that there's some acceptance that at certain times of the year it is going to be working, you know, all hours God sends. And others, it's about then recuperating and taking some spaciousness and taking some time out and t- to, to really um, rest and re-energize for the next band of busyness. Um, so I think it is possible, but it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a conscious um, connection to it that I have to have on a daily basis and really look at my calendar and and sometimes there's some sadness around having to let go of things that I would love to do um because there just isn't the capacity at the moment um and and the more and more we have getting ahead graduates who have been through our um two-year program who are looking at building resources the more and more I've found that local people have helped support us problem solve that so initially it is about investing time and energy with the local person to see in what way they want to engage with us 
um, and in any way that we can, investing in them so that we're not um, expecting someone on lower income to, to, to volunteer their time on an ongoing basis. And when we can pay them to be part of the journey, then I feel very passionate about that. Um, and at the same time, if they've got a future story that they want to engage with um, transformative ways of working and empowering ways of working, then it's finding um, opportunities for them to help us problem solve. So I've been finding recently that um, I've been taking the challenge of um, capacity to the local people and saying, you know, there's these amazing opportunities here and I know that you're really interested in this avenue. How can you support us to uh, explore that avenue and help the organisation? Because I feel like... You know, whereas initially it was me starting up a business, now this is a Bridges Out of Poverty is an entity bigger than me. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a movement, and uh, the more um, hands on 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 uh, on board for the, this movement, the the more uh, strengthened and uh, the less uh, burnt out staff will have. So, what kind of when you say like transformative ways of working, what mm. kind of like what's the kind of ethos behind that? What are the kind of things you do? Um, so well, the way that we work is that we really are um, trying to, so there's two parts of our model um, initially. So there's the Getting Ahead program, which is an initial nine week program where we work with local people um, from different areas. Um, initially it was Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but we've been now um, invited to look at across Scotland. That's wonderful. And yeah, so it's exciting that we're expanding um, slowly through conversation. And the local people look at what their life's like now, where they want to be and how they're going to get there. And they develop what we call a future story. And um, the the unique thing about our work is that we pay local people to take part in the work. So they're paid um, through voucher because a lot of people are on the um, benefits. So in order for the benefits not to be affected, they're, they're paid a, a voucher. And we've, uh, we've had the OK from the DWP that we can do that. So they're invested and they're not participants, they're investigators. They're investigating poverty with us in their community. Community. And then a lot of them have lived it, seen it and experienced it. So it's really about um, putting our money where our mouth is and saying your voice is important and we want to invest in that and hear it. And a big part of that is because we uh, we express that as part of our model that oftentimes poverty has been resolved by middle class wealthy people without local people that have experienced poverty at the decision making table. So we want to create conditions where people feel resourced enough so that they can be part of the conversation. So the first thing is to see where they're at initially themselves and um, and then look at the wider aspects of the community so that they can contribute to that. So it's a nine week program and initially it's about raising consciousness about our model and themselves and their lives. And then we go on to look at a 22 month a staying ahead meeting, which is a monthly meeting where local people look at, you said this was your future story. How are we getting on with supporting to make that future story a reality? What could we be doing differently? What organizations have you engaged with? What was that like? What could they do differently, et cetera? So that's one part of our program, our, our model is the bridge, getting ahead program. The other part of our model, the second part of our model is the Bridges Out of Poverty workshops. Here, what we do is we work with staff to understand our model. And a lot of what we do is similar to getting ahead in that um, we express what our model's about, but it's it's over um, a shorter period. Um, we acknowledge that staff won't have the capacity to spend nine weeks with us. So um, we work with staff over a couple of days, usually a two day workshop, and we look at um, different elements of our model. We look at how staff can move away from fix it approach to motivational approach, how easy it is for us to see a problem and want to fix it and go power over and look at more working with. So we know about empowerment and we know about collaboration, but we're really unraveling what that means so it's not just buzzwords. And we help staff who oftentimes come in saying we're already doing it to look at like how easily it is for us to fall into um, doing for um, rather than with and how easily it is for us to consult local people and then say thank you very much I'm going to go away and fix that now without you and um, so we, we we have a reflective space for staff we also want to celebrate staff that really are working in empowering ways and, and, and through the movement um, you know strengthen what they do um, so there's a big bit about empowerment that we look at with staff and then we look at collaboration and what we name it a collaboration as is um, the difference between collaboration and cooperation and coordination so um 
cooperation and coordination is important, but sometimes staff say that they, they call it collaboration, but it's really just signposting and dumping the problem onto someone else. And our model says that true collaboration is where you've got a shared vision, a shared budget, and you're taking shared risks and shared accountability. And staff have told us that they go to meetings and oftentimes these forum meetings, everyone's holding on to their own resources and the community suffers. So it's like, how can we, how can we kind of um, truly look at how to collaborate you know, where can we learn where there's been a history of collaboration and it's worked and continue that and also look at how, what can we do to prepare ourselves before we go into collaborations that haven't perhaps worked previously and learn from them. Um, so empowerment and collaborations is, is, is what we look at with the staff over two days. And with both local people and with organisations, we look at um, our definition of poverty and we look at the causes of poverty because these are the two things that we want to look at addressing. So... Um, when we, when we, the, the third part of our model, once we've had those two elements in place, the Bridges Out of Poverty workshop, where we've got over 150 Bridges Out of Poverty delegates, staff from across Greater Glasgow and Clyde and wider that have learned about our model. And we've got, um, we've, we've facilitated over four Getting Ahead programs across Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So we've got a, a group of resourced local people and we've got some staff that really get our model. And then we bring them together um, as part of a Bridges Steering Committee, quarterly and eternally, because we believe that true transformative change takes years talking 20 to 25 years when we're looking at systemic change so here what we do is we start to look at our model and we start to look at how we can embed that so we look at how well we, first of all we look at our definition of poverty so our definition of poverty is the extent to which an individual an organization or a community does without resources and we so that really helps revolutionize the word poverty in that it's not just local people that are in poverty resources organizations and communities can be too and these resources include financial, which is usually um, the, the one resource that everyone uses to define poverty. But there's others that are out there. There's things like people's and organizations, emotional resources, their trust and integrity, being where they say they're going to be, doing what they say they're going to do, motivation and persistence, uh, physical resources. And I won't name them all, but there's these 11 resources that we need to get ahead. And if one of them's high, the rest increase. And if one's low, then the others are affected. So, for example, if your body's not doing what you want it to, your physical resources are low, then that can affect your emotional, your financial, and all the other resources can become affected. So we help organizations and local people reflect on these 11 resources and how to build them. And we look at how organizations and local people can build getting ahead rather than getting by resources. So if we're offering um, a financial gain, then that's a getting by resource. We're giving someone some finances, a charity, you know, is perhaps helping someone financially. But if we're helping someone lobby for livable wage, that's a getting ahead resource. So we get people to reflect on that. Um, and then we also look at the causes of poverty. So we say that there's four causes of poverty. There's the individual behavior of local people and, and some of the changes that need to be made there. But we believe that a lot of services home in on that and that alone. So it's get a job, lose weight, stop smoking so much. But we think that poverty is a lot wider than that. And we want to address all four aspects through our steering committee. So we also want to look at what we call the absence of human and social capital. Back in the day, we would sit around fires and have conversation. Now we sit in a line in front of a TV that instills fear that it's not safe to come out and um, be part of conversations with your neighbours. Um, organisations working within silos, you know, so that's that absence of human and social capital which the steering committee wants to tackle. Um, we also want to tackle exploitation, which are these kind of financial predators that prey on deprived areas, money lenders charging huge interest rates, drug dealers. Why are these allowed to... Um, prey on deprived areas and who's lobbying against them so our steering committee wants to address that and our getting ahead program does that just through dialogue and the local people oftentimes through speaking with others stop using some of these um financial predators and find alternatives especially around christmas time here you know um when when uh, the consumerism and the pressures of that will um lead us into the tyranny of the moment and and perhaps um, move us towards um, making decisions around how we borrow money that, that maybe aren't in line with our future stories. So local people make changes naturally, but we also want to look at systemically why we're enabling these exploiters to exist in our communities in the way that they do. And then lastly, the fourth, fourth cause of poverty is the political and economic structures. And it's kind of what I touched on before, in that policies are being made by middle-class, wealthy people
people without a single person just uh, from poverty sitting at the decision making table um, and we look at something called classism we believe that you know um, it's really important that we look at racism and sexism when it comes to addressing transformative ways of working but we also believe that depending upon which economic class you come from or the amount of resources that you've been um brought up with or have in your life, your opportunities to engage and, and get ahead can be affected. And so we want to create conditions where people that probably perhaps have low resources are able to become part of decision making and planners conversations and not feel like they're imposing or that they're asked to tell their story and then we're away fixing it again without them. So um, that's kind of what our steering committee is about as well. So um, yeah, that that that's that's kind of in a in a very big nutshell what the the movement is that we're trying to work towards. So I mean that that does cover quite a lot of things. Mm. Does that make it difficult to measure social impact? Um, well, we've done some work with an independent um, evaluator, and um, we we again we laugh about this during getting ahead because middle class people love a statistic. So in terms of measuring impact, you know we do need to respond to that. So we had someone come in and evaluate. I'm very passionate, as you can hear, about the model. So I'm going to say it's great. So we had an independent person come in and interview getting ahead graduates, and say you know the change that's happened in your life. You know the fact that. You're now, um, you know, previously you couldn't get out of bed due to depression and now you're getting up and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're carrying out activities that are helping you, support you, get ahead. Um, is that because you went to um, getting ahead or is it because you went and got sober somewhere or is it because you joined that gym? So the, 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 the social return and investment um, evaluation report with the independent consultant helped us really assess impact in that way and we did the same where um, the independent evaluator interviewed Bridges Out of Poverty delegates and uh, there was a sort of social impact map that was drawn where it showed that the short term outcomes through coming to our movement is that you know you, you get to have a bit more hope with all the um, cuts in society you know um, resources being so low people are starting to think well I've gone into this field but I didn't come in see, wanting to see you know, people having to be dependent on food banks and some of the, the poverty issues that are just depressing staff. So there's some hope that they have that we're looking at systemic change as a short term outcome. Then the mid, mid, middle, um, the medium term outcome has been around uh, small collaboratives that are being formed by organisations as a part of the Bridges Steering Committee, a neutral environment where they're learning about this model and naturally they're starting to collaborate and, um, and do things together within organisations. We've got a number of housing associations that are looking to start facilitating um, you know, getting ahead programs as a, as a as a cohort, which is very exciting, and then um, the longer term impact uh, that the independent evaluators helped us see, um, which again, like I mentioned before, it takes years, is about breaking down um, barriers within structures, within policies that are stopping people from getting ahead. So we're not just homing in on an individual needing to lose weight, get a job, and stop smoking as much. But it's about systemically, what are we doing with, um, you know, how, what's employment like in our communities? How many mums that have childcare issues are able to go and find work and, and, and sustain it? Um, and if we're wanting to be put, to lose weight, what's our green space like? How safe is it? How easy is it to go and join a, um, a gym and, 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 and feel like you belong in that space? Um, uh, you know, again, have a physical trainer that perhaps someone in a more wealthy environment might have um, access to, etc. It was all about like transforming lives and communities from the from every aspect, not just one, like you said Absolutely. earlier on, but from every perspective. Yeah, basically. and when to, when it comes to measuring impact, there's a lot about the you know the the kind of uh, we we carry, we we do record quite a lot of data and feedback from organisations and local people that you know have been through the the process and are continuing to go through the process and our bridges steering committee is another place where because we meet eternally it's not like we've parachuted in and disappeared and said we did a great job we constantly are measuring what we're doing and how um how in line we are with the model through the the, the meetings there and um we're con constantly you know um, I'd love to be at a position where I'm, you know, out of a job when it comes to dealing with disempowerment and poverty. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be there yet. But so I think it's a long haul process in terms of measuring impact. Um, and it's an ongoing one. So and, and, and what's really been powerful is local people's stories. So I know I said that it's not about exploiting people for their stories and then saying goodbye. But there is something really amazing about when a local person says, this is what it's like living in poverty. And um, and this is, you know, this is this is why I 
can't get ahead and I'm just getting by in the world today. And that triggers heartstrings, which then enables um, community members to really feel um, impassioned to start looking at uh, becoming part of a movement and change, uh, the need for change, social, positive social change becomes more and more motivating for people. Um, and that, you know, it, it's amazing to watch. I mean, I've, I've, I've facilitated um, a Getting Ahead program where Getting Ahead graduates have spoken at training with staff and I've had staff speak initially about, in a very trusting environment, you know, saying things like, you know, it's great that, um, you know, we need to, we need, we need local people to make changes and stuff. But what I'm witnessing is that, you know, that they've not paid their rent and they're busy getting their nails done. And there's some judgments that have been about, um, you know, blaming that goes on both at the, you know, local people level at, at the government and also at the, at the kind of organizational level at local people. And we're about gaining understanding and not making judgments. And we wanting to people, to people to come together. And, um, and 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 having had initial viewpoints like that about some stigma against local people in poverty, then going through the two day workshop and hearing someone's story and the transformation that happens at the individual level, which I get to witness, which for me is really exciting because if if there's changes in people's mindsets about people in poverty, then I can only imagine what that person's um, experience will be like when they go and engage with that service in the future. And um, my hope is that there's more compassion and um, more empathy around um, where people are at in terms of um, trying to get ahead and the challenges that they may face um, because of because of uh, where they're at today. I think that's a really positive note to end mm. on. Um, is there anything else you want to add or anything you want to say to me before we finish? I don't think so. I guess just thanks for the opportunity around. Um, Thank you for being coming down. To connect. I really you. appreciate you having a chat with me. Thank you. Thank you. As you could probably tell, Amitra's enthusiasm is boundless, and it was really great to have her down here for a chat. I could listen to her talk all day about poverty and how we can combat it. Her vision for her business is brilliant and I wish them all the success. I think it was fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please take a second to rate us and review us on iTunes if you can. We really appreciate that. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and subscribe to this podcast. You can do that through whatever podcasting app you're listening to this podcast in. Until next time, goodbye. The Kibble Podcast Network is brought to you by Kibble Education and Care Centre one of Scotland's oldest charities and Scotland's specialist provider of services for at-risk children and young people. Our care, education and specialist interventions help disadvantaged young people build themselves a brighter future. For more information, please visit www.kibble.org.